Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Face Facts by Dr. Yusra. On today's podcast, I have Mr. Mohammed Ahmed, our weight loss specialist and deputy director of pharmacy at an NHS trust. And today we've talked about ultra processed foods, the impact it has on your health and your well-being, and also on your food choices. We've advised you on what foods you should be taking and which ones to avoid. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, and welcome to today's podcast. So on today's Thanks. podcast, I have Mr. Ahmed again. Um, so our last podcast was on Ozempic, Wigovi, Manjaro, routine medication now being given to patients who are suffering with overweight mm. and obesity. Uh, and we've talked about the health benefits of that and also the potential implications and mm. side effects. But today we are exploring another aspect of weight and um, that is nutrition and food. Mm -hmm. So before we start, um, Mr. Ahmed, can you please introduce yourself and your background? Sure. My name is uh, Mohammed Ahmed. So I'm currently a, a deputy director of pharmacy at Acute uh, NHS Trust. But prior to that, I was a mental health specialist pharmacist for about seven or so years. Um, but I've got a real interest in diet, weight loss, um, lifestyle factors. Um, so myself and uh, a business partner, we were kind of early adopters into the GLP-1 medications and what they mean for patients. Um, so we do offer training as well to like healthcare professionals on the use of these drugs, as well as the lifestyle aspects of them. So real kind of personal interest in this, uh, really keen to help people as well and, and provide that kind of holistic approach to it. And I think that's what makes you really special, if I may say so, is that you are not, uh, although you are a pharmacist mm. and I'm, you know, my background is a medical professional, we are very much, our ethos is holistic health, mm. first and foremost. And that means empowering our patients to take ownership of their health journey and not just throwing medication at them, whether they have depression or anxiety, yeah. and that was your background in mental health. Um, and uh, when it comes to weight loss, not just giving them injections to self-medicate yeah, at home, but actually supporting them with uh, lifestyle changes. And I think it's important for patients to understand what being overweight or obese means in terms of their long-term mm. longevity, um, but also the impact of nutrition. Um, and also taking away the feeling of shame and embarrassment mm. because the reality is we are in an environment at the moment that... I think uh, pushes us into being overweight mm. and obese. This is not an isolated concern. 70% of the UK population are mm. overweight or obese and it's a global pandemic, really an epidemic mm. and something that we know is killing us softly, yeah. uh, slowly and softly. So can you tell us a little bit more about the implications of being overweight? So the health implications would be um, sort of negative outcomes in terms of cardiovascular health. So you've got increased risk of um, developing heart attack, developing stroke. Um, you've got increased risk of developing certain types of cancers as well. So they're associated with being overweight, um, increased risk of um, metabolic disease. So your uh, diabetes, it can, or your risk of diabetes will increase. Um, your kind of general functioning in terms of your, your ability to undergo just daily activities will reduce as well. So that extra weight burden can, can lead to osteoporosis or osteoarthritis. Um, so there's a whole suite of negative physical effects, but also mental effects as well from being overweight uh, in terms of your energy levels, your sense of well-being, um, your kind of psychological happiness with your own body image. Mm. Um, so it's a whole suite of consequences and a lot of um, kind of, there's even more nuanced issues, but a lot of like what we see in secondary care are consequences of physical health um, detriments to, to being overweight and, and the weight gain aspects of that, that can occur during you know, mm. someone's life. And we talked in our earlier podcast about the way that we gain weight mm. and what happens to our fats. So essentially mm. we have a set number of fat cells and as we put on weight, those fat cells increase in size rather than um, gaining new fat cells, mm. so to speak. But when you have too much fat coming in or too much sugar coming in, our body has a normal regulatory process where we have this insulin um, release mm. when food is, is taken in. And that insulin takes that sugar out of the bloodstream and uh, creates storage into our bodies mm. or uses it for energy. But when you have too much of it and there is this over... A supply of, of sugar that gets turned into fat it doesn't have anywhere to go. So it goes to your liver mm. and it goes to your 
surrounds your organs and that's called visceral fat. And then those fat cells start to leak out pro-inflammatory messages, which then have an impact on our gut microbiome, have an impact on our psychological well-being. So you have an increased rate of patients developing anxiety or depression. Um, and you have this pro-inflammatory network mm. where you're more likely to develop dementia, Alzheimer's, develop yeah. 13 different types of cancers, insulin resistance, and so on. But the, the overpowering kind of end conclusion is that this is something that patients can reverse. Mm. But is it willpower alone? Is it nurture or nature? Mm. And does our food have an impact on that? Yeah, ab absolutely. It's There's an environmental aspect and the food and food selection is really key. So willpower will take you so far. But if you think about actually what is it we're battling here, mm. um, it only takes somebody to just look around and pick up your phone. You've got four different ways of ordering food right now from any restaurant in Liverpool uh, where we are. Um, you can walk into any supermarket and you're bombarded with all the colors of the different uh, options available. And, and you think this is what we're kind of battling against. Um, so whilst willpower can can help in the short term, the long term is you're never going to win that battle and it's not about willpower. So we have to think smarter than that. We think we have to think more strategically about how we can combat it. Because um, if we think about the, the food industry, um, you know, what do they need? They need us to purchase these foods to, for them to make a profit. Mm. So they will do absolutely everything they can to make you purchase this food and continue to purchase it. So you're dealing with, you know, food scientists who have whole degrees in um, how crisps are made. Yeah. Um, you know, walkers have got um, mannequins which will assess the, the crunch of a crisp, the mouth feel. Um, so this is what we're dealing against. One um, of those mannequins is my patient. Oh, I have really? a patient who works at Walker's Crisps and her job is to taste all the crisps <laughs> that are made and choose the one that doesn't lead to, it doesn't make you stop basically. It yeah. results in this craving and has the ultimate crunch. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I know that you've talked about in the past. We've had conversations about yeah, this yeah. where the food is formulated in such a way that even when your body is telling you I've had enough, the pleasure mm. of that food makes you eat more. Yeah. There's something called the uh, food reward hypothesis. So it's trying to explain why we have this obesity problem. Mm. Um, and if we think about evolutionary, you know, humans have been around for thousands of years. During that period of time, we didn't have ultra processing with the foods. We would grow our own foods uh, and our bodies are designed to regulate our appetite and regulate our consumption based on those foods. Mm. Now we're in an environment where that's being circumvented. So our body's ability to regulate itself is being counteracted and we're leading to, it's leading to overconsumption. If you think about all our body systems, regulation of blood pressure, regulation of breathing, body temperature, it's all automatic. Mm -hmm. And our appetite is generally automatic. But when we introduce drugs to affect blood pressure and, and breathing, et cetera, we can affect the change. And that's what's happening with the food is it's being manufactured in a way that is affecting how we then regulate it to the point of you eat more and then therefore you gain more weight. So there's that kind of general aspect of we're eating more and then we can talk about why those particular foods cause you to eat more. Mm. Um, but we also need to consider it's not just the food, um, it's the habit process. So if you're driving down and you see the big M arches, that triggers the, the kind of habit cycle of, oh, I see McDonald's, you then will then trigger, well, I crave the reward of having had that McDonald's. You then pull into the drive-through, and before you know it, you've ordered something <laughs> on your way out. Uh, and it's the same when you get to the counter in it, in you know any supermarket, and you'll see some chocolate bars lined up because automatically you'll just grab it and then put it on the counter. So there's that environmental aspect and and the kind of habit form and that goes with it. That's even before you've put the food in your mouth, mm. and it starts from a young age. You know. If you think about children, um, happy meals, you, you're building that in. I need to be careful in case, you know, we, we get into uh, too much of that commercial aspect, but I'm really passionate about this because mm. it, it does affect, you know, from that early age, you kind of build that culture of this is okay. These foods are fine. Mm. Um, the problem isn't with the food. It's with me if I eat too much of it. Um, and it kind of leads us to that point of, because obesity is gradual. It mm. doesn't take much it takes um, maybe an extra consumption of about 15 calories a day. 15. Yeah. So 15 mm. calories a day over the course of, you know, two decades 
leads to maybe a gradual weight gain of maybe a kilo a year, 10 years, that's over a stone and a half, 20 years, two or three stone, you know, so you've gone from somebody who's fairly lean when they were younger to just gradually, gradually, gradually have put on Mm. that level of weight. And it's very insidious, you know, 13 calories, 15 calories, that's like a squirt of ketchup. You know, Mm. you wouldn't necessarily notice it, but because your body's so good at regulating itself, you can live a lean life. Um, But when we're in this environment, it's very challenging and we have to be savvy. So it's not about Oh, I just won't eat it. That's like kind of the low level. We need to be strategic with it. We need to manage our food environment. If we find ourselves stopping at McDonald's on the way home, we need to find a different way mm. to drive home. Mm. So things like that. So these strategies are what we try and build in with with our patients mm. is let's get to the core of what your particular problem is. So this food reward hypothesis, mm. is this, do you think that this is a new phenomena that people are experiencing or has this been around since caveman days? It's, it's been around for for as long as we've been around because we need to be motivated to eat so that we stay alive and so your body's very good at that you know there's reasons certain things are enjoyable because there's an evolutionary reason to have those in place Mm. so we think of procreation if the reason it's enjoyable is because that's an outcome that we need for society Um, and eating is one of those outcomes Mm. so when we have something um that will provide a high level of energy, Mm. then that triggers your body to then crave that again. So when times were difficult, when food wasn't as abundant as it it is now, that made sure that we survived. Mm. Uh, When, you know, hunter gatherers found a big pot of honey, they ate as much as they could of it because you don't know when the next pot of honey is going to appear. But actually now, you know, we're very fortunate in Western society where we don't have those problems. Mm but it's kind of tipped the other way Mm. where food is so abundant, but we still have that drive Mm. to want to have those high density, uh, high calorie dense foods Mm. um, that we're then driven to overconsumption because your body doesn't necessarily know that you could just open the fridge again and pull out another one. Mm. You can just go to the shop again and buy another one. Mm. Um, It's not designed in that way. Mm. Um, So what, if you think about kind of neural pathways, uh, a lot of, behavior is driven by, for example, dopamine and and the reward. Uh, So the dopamine kind of reinforces a behavior. Um, So these foods that we now consume trigger that pathway that reinforce the behavior of eating more of those foods. Um, And because of the way they're manufactured, where they remove certain aspects of it, refine certain aspects of it, it kind of really shortcuts what would normally be different steps in that regulation. And if we think about drugs, for example, um, narcotics, you know, they like heroin, why is heroin more addictive than um, like opium? Mm. It's because it's refined to that point where it really targets those particular areas. Mm. Um, So foods are kind of becoming designed in that way. So how they feel in your mouth, the right balance of sugar and salt, triggers that reward pathway Mm. so then that leads to that consumption but what they don't really do is talk to the other parts of the body so you get this kind of conflict Mm. and people may have experienced it where they will eat some fast food and actually they don't feel that full Mm. afterwards and then they crave more so Mm. they end up eating more than they would normally Mm. and when you look at the calorific content it's actually quite significant Mm. whereas if we kind of replace that with whole foods Mm it's actually really difficult to overeat. So analogy I use is if, you know, if I gave you three donuts, you could probably eat that, you know, three Krispy Kremes. uh, You wouldn't necessarily feel great about yourself afterward, but you could probably do it, but you know, physically, and you might even enjoy it. If I gave you a whole chicken and said, I want you to eat that without any sauce or anything, you're going to really struggle to get through it because you'll feel so full Mm -hmm. so quick. And that's because the way that food, your body's designed to eat the chicken, it's not really designed to eat the donuts and Mm. the calorie content might be about the same, but you're going to over consume one compared to the other. So this is really interesting in terms of calorie content. And Mm. also essentially what you're talking about is the body recognizing and responding physiologically Mm. to what we're putting in our mouths. Mm. And it might not be, you know, if all of us can look at fast foods and say, well, McDonald's is probably, I'm, I'm not afraid of McDonald's suing me. I'm pretty sure we can all agree that McDonald's isn't the healthiest of mm. foods. And you know, I first started to recognize the importance of healthy diet at the age of 28 when after I had um, my autoimmune condition, I went to see a functional medicine doctor 
at a time when nobody was really talking about them, you know, like mm. over a decade, no, a decade ago. <laughs> and, um, and he said to me, what's your diet like? And I said, it was pretty good. And he said, define good. And he really, we really mm. broke it down. And he made me, essentially, he said, no eating anything out of a can. And he said, you need to go and get fresh organic eggs from a farmer's market. And he introduced me to this idea of eating whole foods mm. um, and seeing food as medicine and medicine as food. And I really got it then. And after that, you know, I went home and I said to my husband, I've got all this joint pain. I was really suffering. And I said, we have to go to a farmer's market every Sunday and buy organic mm. eggs. So that's what we were mm. doing until mm. we now have six chickens in our backyard. Yeah, um, so I, I started to recognize the importance of what you put in your body because mm. that is your fuel. And that's what's, you know, the, you're only, some people might not like this, but the concept of you are what you eat. You can only chug out what you put in. Mm. But it might not be as obvious to people. You know, they might look, look at a peanuts, for example, yeah. and look at peanut. I, I had these two bags of peanuts in my house uh, last night and my son was eating salt and vinegar peanuts. And I picked it up and I thought, well, this is relatively healthy. Mm. Um, and the, the, the same company made um, peanuts that were salted. So not salt and vinegar, salted. And I turned it around and I looked at the ingredients and it said peanuts, um, hydrogenated oil, and salt. Mm. And I thought, not that bad. Then I looked at the salt and vinegar one and it had emulsifiers, stabilizers, uh, xanthan gum, all kinds of things. And I thought, oh my God, it, it's on the outside, the, the packaging mm. looks very similar. The number of calories was both was similar in both mm. of them. And the uh, green, red, you know, the traffic light system, which so many of us in the United Kingdom have become accustomed to yeah. as a a predictor of the health of the food mm. looks exactly the same, but actually the ingredients were not. And he ate that packet of, of peanuts and immediately wanted another one. So he didn't feel full. Whereas I ate the packet of the, of the ready sauce yeah. and felt very full yeah. and, and satiated. So there is something to be said about how our body responds to ultra processed mm. foods. Mm -hmm. Ingredients in our, in our modern food that actually was never meant to be food. Yeah. Talk to me about ultra processed foods. Is there, and the definition, so to speak. Yeah. So food processing has been around for, you know, almost as long as we have like butter, um, milk, although, although there are other forms of processing breads, but what kind of is the modern age is, is brought in is industrialized foods. Mm. So that ultra processing is where you take what is a kind of the raw ingredients and you manipulate it in such a way that it barely resembles what it started off as mm. um, and then start to add in um, additives, chemicals, which enhance in terms of the food uh, profile, the taste profile, the uh, shelf life. You start to add those in to the point where you have essentially like an edible product mm. that may or may not be food in mm. that sense. Um, and the ultra processing, it kind of, talks a bit more like what that what that means so the difference between you making your own pasta at home uh your own pasta bolognese versus you buying a ready meal um so the pasta bolognese you made at home might be somewhat processed in that you, you know, you've got chopped tomatoes which have gone from a real tomato into a chopped one but the microwave ready meals got all these emulsifiers and other additives in so they, there isn't like a real uh, textbook definition mm. of what ultra processed food is but the rule of thumb is does it include things I have at home? Mm. So if you look at the back of the packet and you're like, hey, I don't have emulsifiers and mm. uh, whey isolates and all these E numbers, then that probably is ultra processed. Mm. So there isn't like a label as such. Um, another thing I like to kind of use is, does it look like something that came from an animal or the ground or a tree? Yeah. You know, does this look like it appears in nature in one way or the other? If it doesn't, then it's probably ultra processed. Yeah. You know, if you think of like a, a squishy uh, sweet or a Haribo, mm. like there's nothing like that in nature. Mm. You know, you look at it and go, that that's clearly ultra processed. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what we try and use to help. Um, so if you think about the, the two main things are um, ultra processed foods make us eat more of them. Mm. Um, they kind of trigger that food reward and everything, but also by nature of that, they include ingredients which themselves cause us to gain weight. So it's the two together that you've got a high caloric content plus the hyper palatability, we call it. So just the taste is, they're, they're really tasty to us. So 
combine the two together, you've got something that's really tasty, that's high in calories. So you eat more of it. And because mm. it's high in calories, you gain the weight. Mm. So your body's not really designed to, to kind of manage that on a large scale. So whilst we might eat honey because it's tasty and high in calories, that's okay. Because in Punta Gatherer, that would occur infrequently. But now if you're doing that all the time, the weight gain will come with it. So your body's really good at kind of regulating its own appetite. Um, if you think about children, children are a good example because those of you who've got children, when you try and when they're when they're young and you try and get them to eat when they're not hungry, they will not eat. But if they're hungry, you can't get them to stop. Mm. Um, and we gradually erode that. You yes. know, we force them to stay at the dinner table. We force them to clean their plate because that's what we were told to do. Yeah. And they stop listening to their bodies and their own regulation, and they over over consume, and that kind of builds in. So one of the things we try and do is actually let's we need to bring that back. We need mm. to bring our body's own regulation in. Um, and I, I always say, like, if I stuck you on a desert island and there were only whole foods, you probably wouldn't be overweight. Mm. If we think about 60s, uh, 50s, you know, 1950s, 1960s, before like these hyper processed foods came in, the levels of obesity were lower. People, mm. there were still people who would become overweight, but they would be fewer and far between. And mm. mostly people would be in fairly, you know, lean physical condition. Um, and that is mostly driven by the food, but also now we've got the sedentary aspect of our lifestyles and uh, physical activities decline. So that plays a part, but the bigger part is the nutrition aspect. Mm. Um, so knowing that it helps us counteract it. I think um, there's, so mu there's so much to talk about here. I, yeah. could, I could sit here and talk to you about this um, all day. I'm reading a book at the moment, which I know you've read mm. uh, by Dr. Chris Van Tulliken called mm. Ultra Processed People. And it's really quite eye-opening. Um, and he's a twin. Yeah. And his twin, Zand, who lives in America, mm. identical twins. So genetically, they are exactly the same. Mm. And if you did a paternity test, his children would, would you know, they, you, could, you could look at, you could do a genetic test and look at Zand and his children would look like it's actually Zand's yeah. children. But he's overweight, obese, in mm. fact. Um, and that's because of his environment. Uh, where he was in an environment where the food was essentially all ultra processed. And it's easy, I think, nowadays to go into a supermarket and think that you're picking up something that is mm. nutritious. Look at the color coded, um, you know, the, the traffic light system, like Cocoa Pops, you know, it looks mm. relatively healthy. Mm. Um, it says fortified with vitamins. It's got more greens than reds or oranges on the traffic light system. So you think that you're giving your children mm. a healthy start to the day, but actually what you're doing is you're giving them something that um, is not food. Mm. It's ultra processed and it overrides. It's this consistent overriding. So yeah. the insulin spikes aside, which we have talked about in the previous mm. podcast, which you know, if you're having high um, or lots of frequent sugar intake, what happens is you have this release of insulin, which then tells, which your body then becomes mm. accustomed to. And, and you get this boy who cried wolf is how I say it, um, sort of thing that happens when you, and your neuroreceptors say, I just can't handle this mm. anymore. And mm. you get insulin sensitivity and then the insulin can't do its job. So you get a buildup of visceral fats. That aside, the way that our brains work is very interesting because we have neuroplasticity mm. so we can change our neural pathways and if we start to eat things that resemble food then our body starts to react in the same way mm. um, even with things like diet coke so diet coke which is essentially zero calorie mm. but has aspartame our body responds to the sweetness by releasing insulin and mm. actually that makes us more hungry mm. and so you get this 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 um physiological pathway that gets that gets throat, mm. you know, sparked off every time we eat foods that are not food yeah. and um and 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 as you said because our foods are now ultra processed and have been curated to such a way that when we are eating them it overrides the body's ability to mm. recognize that mm. we're eating foods our, our body we're eating we're consuming calories but our brain doesn't tell us that we're full so yeah. we consume more yeah. or it's so pleasurable that even though our body tells us that we're full we keep going yeah and then and and 
And I think another problem with um, what we've done with children is a distraction method mm. that I did with my first child that I now regret. You know, now I just let myself, if my baby's hungry, you know, my two-year-old, do you have a two-year-old? Yeah. If he's hungry, he'll eat. If he's not hungry, he won't eat. Mm. And actually he's reaching for broccoli. He's reaching for fruit. He's stopping when he's full. And I leave him to it because I know that his body has its own way of regulating yeah. his yeah. calorie intake. Whereas back in the day when I had my first child a decade ago and didn't know any better, we'd do distraction and eat a little bit more. And actually you see it now, you go to restaurants and, and children are on their phones. Mm. They're completely distracted. They're in a, and they're in this kind of trance like state mm. and their parents are putting spoonfuls of food in their mouth and they're just eating it without any conscious thoughts. Um, and, and therefore their bodies start to go, stop recognizing when they were full. Yeah. I mean, I could talk all day about this, but I think mm. one of the things that's really important is it's let your body help you. Mm. So your body is designed to regulate its appetite. Mm. You just need to treat it in a way that allows it to provide that function. So by selecting like whole foods, mm. you're tapping into a lot more, um, a lot more tools that allow you to regulate your appetite. So if you think about an ultra processed food, they have certain things in common. Mm. They're usually quite soft. Mm. They're very tasty. They're easy to chew, easy to swallow. Um, they don't sit in the gut for very long, so they pass through quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So you kind of say conventing not just the food reward aspects, but the physical aspects of how your body regulates. So if you think about if I give you a sourdough bread sandwich, yeah. it's chewier. Yeah. So it takes you longer to eat. Yeah. So it, it's more effort to eat that. Yeah. So maybe, um, you know, you, the kind of balance of effort and reward because it takes a bit more effort. You're not going to have as much to eat, but also because it takes you longer to chew. You've, your body's got opportunity then to start releasing the, the peptides that we talked about in the, in the other GLP podcast, one. GLP-1, yeah. to start to then switch off some of that appetite. But if you chew it so fast, it goes straight into your gut. Mm. You don't have that same level of um, secretion. Mm. And then once it gets to your gut, if the food isn't like bulky, it's not going to get that stretch in the stomach which means that you, that's another way of signaling to your body that you're full. So you're not going to get that aspect of it. And then when it doesn't, um, when they are very refined, they're easy to digest. So then they don't stay in the gut as long. Mm. So then the time between meals gets shorter because mm. you feel fuller, uh, you feel uh, hungry quicker. So you've got all those aspects to it. So when you eat whole foods, you're not just thinking the calories, you've got fiber, you know, you've got the different macronutrient components. So um, protein, for example, is very satiating. So whereas fats, you don't trigger the same kind of full fullness, proteins will trigger you to feel fuller quicker. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is it's not just about calorie reduction. It's managing your food selection to mm -hmm. the point where you could get away with maybe eating a thousand less calories a day, but not feel any less full. Or in fact, maybe feel fuller. Um, because you've picked the right foods mm. and that's part of what we're trying to build in because if we think about um weight loss interventions if we use like glp1 agonist etc you lose the weight but how do you prevent that weight regain well your appetite's going to come back but let's regulate it through this food selection mm -hmm. let's not go back to what you were eating because mm -hmm. then we can maintain lower general caloric intake but you feel fine you feel just as full and it does take some transition because those cravings are still there initially, but you can start to, like you said, with the neuroplasticity, you start to erode that mm. and the more you abstain from certain foods and it's not on or off, you know, you, you can still indulge occasionally in, in those foods that, you know, you have enjoyed the ultra processed foods, but it's that kind of general approach. Mm. Um, and then, you know, in terms of food environment, having things in your line of sight makes a big difference. Yeah. So, tap into your body's laziness. So humans are g generally physically lazy in the sense of if you have to exert effort to get something and something's easier, you'll probably go for the easier thing. So if you do want a packet of crisp, keep it in the shop and not in your house. So you have to get off, get off, get in your car, go and buy it, come back. And then mm. you might think, actually, I can't be bothered. Mm. But if it's right in front of you, it's, you easy. Know, it's easy. Like if we had some biscuits on this table, I might not eat it for an hour, but then that last bit where I'm, okay, we finished, um, mm. I'll grab it. But mm. if it's not there, I'm never going to think about it. Mm. So it's those aspects to manage. So there's different so tools out of and sight, avenues. Out of mind and yeah. also keep it as far away as possible. I yeah. know that in your own home, you keep it in the garage, so it's hard yeah, to... Yeah, <laughs> so any treats, they're in the garage, they're really high up. Um, so it's awkward to get. Because, mm. um, you know, we like to keep some things, but if we kept them 
where I can walk past them every day. And, you know, I'm, I take pride in my ability, you know, to manage my weight and everything, but I know where my weaknesses are mm. and I know where I come home from a busy day in work, I will reach for something. So it's not about willpower and I'm like very disciplined. I know my weaknesses, so I don't keep it. And mm. if you were trying to quit smoking, you wouldn't keep cigarettes lying all around your house. You would hide them, you would get them out, you get rid of them. We have to kind of use almost that similar approach. And that's what we try and build with that with our services. Mm. Let's focus in on that. Let's let's manage that aspect of it. So it's not just about reducing your appetite and you lose weight. It's let's look at the lifestyle, all all these different components. So, you know, when we're talking about whole foods, I generally have this um, overriding rule of thumb, which is try and avoid foods that you either don't bleed, mm -hmm. grow or breathe. Mm -hmm. um, and if you kind of stick to that, then you are probably eating better quality yeah. food, real food, so to speak. That's one way that we can do it because we know that when we're eating whole foods, we feel fuller quicker. But you mentioned speeds. Mm. You mentioned speeds of um, how quickly we eat the ultra mm. ultra processed foods. Uh, is there a, do you advise patients to eat slower? Um, and is there a delay in the release of leptin mm. um, and GLP-1, which then tells our patients or signals to our brains actually stop eating? Mm. Um, it's about to Yeah, you got start from almost a moment you smell the food like mm. that anticipation so the the longer it takes for things to pass through the more time your body's got to respond to them mm. um so it depends what you're eating i think if you're eating whole foods uh, and generally veg salads things that are high in fiber high in protein naturally you'll take longer to eat them like if you think of a steak you'd have to chew it and the, the amount of time it takes to get through versus a burger, which, you know, very already ground meat, it's, it goes through quite quickly. So if you're eating whole foods in general, um, you can do what's comfortable, mm. um, but obviously take your time. And part of that, what you mentioned with the distraction is important so that instead of focusing on something external, you're, you're focusing internally. Mm. So that kind of mindfulness element when it comes to eating, um, cause your body will start to signal to you that it's getting full. It will start to signal to you that, you know, you don't need to consume everything that's on the plate. Mm. Um, but if your mind is elsewhere and you're distracted by it, then you might not listen to those signals. So um, I like to use the analogy, like if we're watching um, a film and I've got a big bowl of popcorn, I might get through the whole thing. But yeah. if you sat me against just staring at a wall and go and finish that popcorn, I'll probably get about a quarter of the way through and get bored because, you know, I'm not necessarily hungry. Mm. Um, so it's it's that element. And if you're mm. watching something and that, because, you you know, your attention can only be in so many places at once, mm. um, that mindfulness is actually important. It's quite difficult to break if you mm. try it. Mm. It's not that easy to not scroll through Instagram mm. when you're having something to eat. Mm. But if you put your phone to one side. And just focus on eating. Focus on the meal. Focus on, you know, if it's a family meal as well, the, yeah. the environment, the social aspect of it you'll notice that you're not as interested in the food. You will mm. eventually spontaneously stop eating. Mm. Um, so that's another element that you can feed into it. In terms of juices, mm. what's your general thoughts? Because I know that um, there is some level of confusion mm. um, surrounding liquids mm. um, and how many calories you can take and actually how bad it is for you. What's yeah. your thoughts on that? So your body's ability to um, kind of assess the calorie content of, of liquids, it doesn't really work the same way. So it's, it's very easy to over consume liquid calories mm -hmm. compared to physical calories. And the same sort of reasons, it's washed straight in, um, it doesn't have the bulk. So liquids, uh, juices in particular, tend to be concentrated forms of physical foods. So mm -hmm. if you think one uh, glass of orange juice is how many oranges mm -hmm you could easily drink a glass of orange juice. Could you consume six or seven oranges? Mm. Probably not because the fibers there, the, the, you know, the kind of fleshy content is there. Um, where some people might find the health benefits from juices is certain um, nutrients um, aren't in very high concentrations in bulk food. So if you think of like kale or spinach or something, mm. you might find benefit in concentrating that down mm. um, to just make it easier to consume. But generally if people eat whole foods and have varied vegetable intake and fruit intake. There's not really any need to, to do that unless you've got some diagnosed deficiency um, or a malabsorption issue. There isn't really a need to kind of concentrate it in that. If you just eat a varied um, diet, with that includes different food groups anyway. Um, but liquid calories, and I think people don't necessarily realize how much 
is in those liquid calories. Like mm. if you get a latte from uh, you know, a mm. coffee shop or um, with some caramel in it, you're talking a couple of hundred calories. Now that's the equivalent of um, a really solid meal. Mm. You know, it could be like half a chicken breast salad, uh, some potatoes or something. That, that one drink mm. is the equivalent, especially if you've got whipped cream on top. Um, mm-hmm. you, but your body's not going to have that same physiological response to that drink as it would to that meal. Yeah. Um, what about low fat whipped cream? The problem with low fat, yeah. yeah. So there's, so- there's um, whilst on the surface it looks better in, the, in that it's lower calories, uh, some of the studies that are kind of coming out is that doesn't necessarily mean mm. that you eat less of it. Yeah. Um, so in the short term, yeah, you might mm. have fewer calories coming in, but then the long term you might consume more than you would normally of those. And I think another thing that um, some people don't realize is low fat doesn't mean low sugar. Mm. So often they remove the fat content, but mm. um, they don't remove the sugar content yeah. or they add the sugar to make it palatable. Yeah. Uh, and so people are picking it up thinking it's a healthier yogurt or a healthier cheese or a healthier whipped cream mm. or a healthier milk milk but you're reducing some of the fat and some of that fat that um innate uh, fat has essential fatty acids which are important yeah. for the processing of our body's ability to process vitamins you mm. know lipid soluble vitamins so there's a lot that the food industry has done to confuse us yeah. and make it appear complicated but if we want to simplify it for our patients would you tell them uh, because i personally no longer believe in the traffic light system mm. Um, and I know that you hold a similar belief. Would you tell your patients to read labels? And if so, what are you telling them to look out for? Yeah, so I, I agree in that sense. You know, I, I've i gone through the calorie counting journey and, you know, kind of come full circle in that mm. our bodies are smarter than we actually think. Mm. So firstly, like you said, whole foods, does it look like it came from an animal, the ground, the tree, you know, did it breathe, did it bleed, et cetera? Does it look like that? Okay, that's a start. The next stage is, you know, if we look at that ingredient list, is there things on there that you recognize from your own kitchen mm. that you would probably use? Or is there a lot of things on there that mean nothing to you? Um, have a lot of E in front of it, sound like, you know, industrial chemicals, um, don't sound like foods. If it contains a lot of those products, then it probably isn't something that I would necessarily recommend choosing. Mm. Um so it could be, you know, if you think about even like crisps and popcorn, like you might pick up a bag of popcorn off the shelf and it's just a salt can, kernels and a bit of oil. So it's three ingredients, which you probably have in your own home. You pick up a, um, you know, your favorite kind of crisps and they've got about six lines of ingredients. Mm-hmm. Probably go for the popcorn in that situation. So, yeah. you know, you could still have things that, that can be enjoyable. Um it's just having a look at it and you can tell sometimes you just by visually that this isn't something that I think came from, you know, as a whole food in that sense. Um, so it's, it's a fairly common sense approach. You don't need to bog down into, you know, does it, how much protein does it have? How many, how much fat and, and fat is demonized. I think, um, yes. in that, okay, low fat might mean fewer calories, but high sugar, your body, what does it do when it's got excess sugar? It can t- turns it into fat anyway. So you can get just as much weight gain from from eating only carbohydrate sources as you would mm-hmm. from fat sources. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're missing out on all the essential nutrients, etc. So just having that varied diet of whole foods is, is really the best place to start. Yeah. Um, and, and when in doubt, you know, it's okay to, to occasionally have these kind of processed foods. It's it's about that balance and making sure it's not the staple of your diet, that your mm. staple of your diet is the whole foods. Um, one of the things that I like to educate my patients on are the impact of E-numbers and mm. emulsifiers and regulators, xanthan gum, um, which we see in so much of our food, rapeseed oil, seed mm. oils. And I say to my patients, look, there are these if it's more than five ingredients, start to look deeper mm. into it. Um, and if there are these ingredients that we don't recognize in E-numbers, the impact of these E-numbers, they may not impact negatively the nutritional content of that food, but they can cause an addiction cycle. So mm. food has been, these ultra processed foods have been shown to have this reward hypo, food mm. reward hypothesis mm. and this dopamine release in the same way as smoking has, mm. in the same way as drugs have. And so people even get withdrawal, so to speak. It might not be the same physiological shivers and shakes, but they get withdrawal. Um, They get low moods, they get headaches. 
And um, if you can slowly but surely come away from the ultra processed mm. foods, it, and, and if you have a, a diet high in ultra processed foods, it might be hard to make that in, initial switch. But the more educated you are on the impact mm. of these things on your health, on the understand that actually these have an, an, are clinically been found to be addictive. Um, and start to empower your children as well mm. to read them, then they will make healthier choices as well. Now, when my children say, I want this, I go, okay, you can have it, but understand the health consequence of what that is. Yeah. Read it. Does it, what is this? Do you know what this is? Is this food? Um, and if they start to recognize it, then hopefully they will make healthier choices rather than, than them feeling like they're not allowed to have something. Mm. If you're not allowed to have something and you're told no, yeah. In Arabic, we have this saying, which means what you are not allowed, what you're forbidden, you want. Mm. So rather than forbid it, explain, mm. you know, education is empowerment. Explain to them how to read food labels. Explain to them the impact that it has on having even a little bit, like you said, 15 calories mm. a day can result in obesity over, uh, over a decade or two. Um, and then start to switch to healthier foods, um, and I know that you do a lot of this with your health coaching mm. for our patients. So if you had to, um, if we, we're, I know that we're out of time now, if you had to tell your patients um, three things to help them with their lifestyle factors uh, when it comes to weight loss, what would you say? So I'd say firstly, look at your food environment, like take stock of what's around you in your home environment, in your work environment. You know, do you keep biscuits in the drawer next to you in the desk? Do you keep, uh, you know, crisps and, and other kind of high calorie foods dotted around the house where they're easy to get access to? Um, take stock of that and then put some interventions in place to help reduce that for you. So obviously move them away, replace them with different sources of whole foods like fruits, for example. So that's one thing you can do. Um, the other thing you can do is when you're half having those meals is to maintain that mindfulness aspect. Mm -hmm. So avoid the distractions around those meal times. Listen to your body's signals. Listen to, you know, when it's telling you that it's getting full. Um, it's okay to feel a little bit hungry as well before meals. The world isn't going to end if you don't have a meal <laughs> or a snack within 20 minutes of your stomach rumbling. Um, it, that, that's absolutely fine. You, you, your body can actually last, you know, weeks without actually any food. Um, and you'll physically generally be okay for, for a lot of people. Um, and the third thing is that food selection. So doing as much as you can to eat those whole foods and mm. to have those on your plate and to keep that varied. So um, general kind of rule I, I would tend to say is um, one protein source. So, you know, whether that's fish, eggs, um, meat, uh, kind of any, you know, vegan or vegetarian proteins, if, if you don't eat meat, um, half your plate of some kind of veg or, uh, and that could be, like green leafy veg, like a salad, or it could be something like a broccoli. So low calorie density, but high volume. Um, and then the, the kind of third part of your plate would be some some form of either carbohydrate or fat source. So it could be avocado or some rice or some potatoes, but again, whole foods. Um, and if you kind of use that rule of thumb, um, you generally will find your appetite is regulated a lot more consistently so um, a quarter so half is fruit uh, sorry half is veg yeah. or salad and then a third is your carbs uh, yeah sorry a uh, half um a quarter would be your carbs a quarter is your carbs and, carbs and the other quarter, quarter is your protein. protein got it yeah okay. so a lot of people what they do is they have a side salad or side veg mm. huge plate of like potato rice a mm. little bit of protein yeah um it's tearing that on its head a bit because the, what the veg does is it gives you that kind of mechanical stretch. It's got the fiber. It'll make you feel physically full. Mm. And then the uh, the nutrients are going to come from the, your protein and your fat or your carbohydrate source. Um, and then the protein is important, one, because proteins are really filling macronutrients. So it makes you feel fuller, um, quicker and for mm. longer. It takes mm. a while to digest. And also because um, we tend to under consume protein and there's some hypothesis that if you do that, you're going to eat more of the other foods until you hit like a minimum threshold of protein. Um, and it's really important for like longevity, uh, muscle maintenance, hair, nails, mm. et cetera. So pro protein is important. And if you think a lot of processed foods exclude it because it's so filling and it's an expensive nutrient, you'll find that a lot of the ultra processed foods are not very high in protein, mm. um, which makes you think, well, I probably should eat more if they don't want me to have it. Yeah. Um, so that that's kind of what I would say this general starting point for everybody. And Amazing. Yeah, there's a lot you can read up about that as well. 
Amazing. I think this has been really helpful and useful for our patients. Of course, if anyone wants to book in with you, they can do so via the clinic. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed this and thank you for joining. Thank you for having me.